We are back for another provocative talk. Mark Feldman was, uh, and his colleagues were instrumental in discovering the pathophysiology underneath rheumatoid arthritis, a crippling disease that's one of a family of crippling diseases. He discovered the mechanism and the, and the, the treatment that has transformed the natural history of the disease for countless numbers of patients. He continues to think about the problems of inflammatory diseases and to sort through the issues of cost and access for these um, critical drugs. And we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's traditional at meetings to thank to thank the organizer because the, the reason you thank him is you want to be invited again. But here, of course, it's not the issue because uh, it was the implicit invitation that once you come, you can come any time you like. And, I was, and of course, since this has been exactly as described, the most uh, eclectic and entertaining meeting you're likely to come, um, I almost certainly will come again. We've heard here some enormously important uh, talks. Uh, uh, how civilization, as we know it, is likely to end rather soon if we don't change uh, patterns. Uh, uh, how we need to manage death rather more actively. How we can add more life to our years. Uh, so in the context of this meeting, I thought I'd not give you my usual seminar, which I can do uh, almost asleep, but I'd try and distill from my uh, experiences uh, some broader issues. Uh, and so the topic um, I've chosen is, uh, can we define uh, ways of developing therapies better? Better means both cheaper and more effective. Cheaper because the great majority of our diseases are undertreated. You know, 20% of women have endometriosis, no treatment. 25% of women have fibroids, no treatment. And you could, the list goes on and on. Most of our diseases have no treatment at all. The industry is focused on, as most scientists are, in where the success has been, because once you've had one success, uh, you can carry on. And uh, the subtitle is Reminiscence from the Frontline, uh, because uh, I've had the good fortune uh, to um, a look at a development of a treatment from the initial idea uh, to its uh, complete execution. Yeah. So I want to discuss with you the problems of developing new medicines, uh, why I've got an opinion and perhaps might have some insights, and do we have any solutions? And these are all hypotheses. Uh, uh, one doesn't know, one, cannot, one knows one has an opinion, whether one has some insight as a hypothesis uh, and a solution that I've put in a uh, question mark, because we certainly don't know that. So what's the pro biggest problem in healthcare? Well, the problem in healthcare is that it costs a lot of money, and it's going to cost more and more and more uh, as we get older. And as somebody who is getting older, I think that's a great thing. But uh, uh, all the same, the average cost of a new medicine is well over a billion, uh, but the cost of a medicine is actually, cost of healthcare is mostly not drugs, it's a lot of other costs, and the estimates for the cost of medicine is probably only about 15% of the total healthcare bill. So what I'll be talking to you about is a small subset of a bigger problem, but uh, I'll be talking to you about the things uh, I know something about. Uh, and, but a topic I feel very strongly about is that the way uh, we design our medicines, we tend to stop too early. We accept inadequate efficacy, and we actually don't cure anything. Uh, uh, I think we could certainly do better. So this is the um, problem, uh, the cost problem of developing new drugs. Uh, this is Jack Scannell, who gave a lecture in Oxford I attended. So I've borrowed this slide, and uh, he's here at the meeting. A and he's defined that the cost uh, of each new medicine has gone up dramatically. It's now well over a, a billion dollars. 
And this is clearly uh, unsustainable uh, if we want to be developing a lot more medicines. So how do, what, what's happened to my career that uh, I feel able to pontificate and speculate how to make medicines better in more general terms? Well, in the uh, development of new treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, I've seen uh, it go from the beginning right through to the end. Uh, the hypothesis which we tested uh, that cytokines, molecular mediators of inflammation may be important in arthritis, uh, uh, I developed and published in 83. Uh, we identified uh, candidate cytokines in 89, did the first proof of principle in 92, uh, led registration trials, which led to approvals, led to assessments of cost effectiveness, that this was cost effective uh, treatment should be paid by payers who don't want to pay. This NICE is a British uh, organization. It stands for National Institute for Clinical Excellence. The uh, name in the pharmaceutical industry is not NICE because they, they basically are a rationing system to refuse to approved drugs whose cost effectiveness is not high. And they do do so. For example, uh, the first JAK kinase inhibitor, tofacitinib for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Pfizer thought, thought this would be a dramatic breakthrough. It's a pill instead of an injection. And if you're a chemist, a pill is wonderful. An injection is barbaric. Uh, and it's, so they price this same price as anti-TNF. But unlike the, the, the fact that the cytokines, anti-cytokines are very precisely targeted antibodies. With antibodies, it's very easy to check the specificity. You just take a whole, whole sections of a whole body. If it doesn't bind to where you don't have your ligand, when you can test it on lots of proteins, very much harder to do with small chemicals. So tofacitinib was not specific. So the FDA approved it for one dose only, no dose escalation. Uh, the uh, European agency declined. And uh, so, of course, uh, this is an issue of uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, this wasn't very cost effective. So the, uh, the medicines we uh, uh, developed, invented, whatever, uh, are now the world's biggest drug class since 2012. And this is both a plus and a minus. The sales of anti-TNF are 27 billion per year. It might sound to be a wonderful commercial success. But in medical terms, uh, it's driven by the high cost. So 27 billion is only between 1 and 2 million patients treated for a year. So it's a bit duplicitous, a bit uh, unfortunate uh, that this is the way it's become the biggest drug class. But uh, there's something that very few people know, that the ultimate badge of success in therapeutics is the frequency of your visit to the law courts and the lawyers. Because if a lot of money is being made, there's a lot of people that are not keen uh, on paying the bills. Uh, and really what I want to do is to compare success to failure because uh, the monumental cost of new of each new medicine, over a billion, that Jack Scannell documented, is the cost of failure. Most people would not know that because they don't know what success looks like. But uh, we've been involved in the anti-TNF project from the hypothesis uh, to the current state, and I've helped uh, in a significant way two other successful projects. I was the immunology consultant for Herceptin, uh, anti-HER2 antibody uh, developed by my friend Mike Shepard uh, and uh, the first orally available uh, pill phosphodiesterase type 4 inhibitor for psoriasis and uh, arthritis uh, with uh, cell gene apremolase. And really the cost of a successful drug uh, is probably 50 to 100 million. And the, one, the excess to a billion is because you've got to amortize the cost of failure. So what is the reason for these failures? Well, I th I'll, try, I'll try and summarize these, and then I'll get to a little bit more detail. Well, 
I think we could reduce a lot of the costs of failure if research in the pharmaceutical industry was uh, less secretive. Open research is the way we do science. We do science, we do an experiment, we publish it, other people criticize it or build on it, and that's how progress works. If you do it entirely within your four walls, uh, the likelihood that you're going to have a, the highest success rate and get it all right is not uh, high. And of course, in industry, uh, there's both secretiveness uh, in preclinical uh, and as well in the clinical. And there are some monumental disasters, for example, uh, the P38 MAP kinase inhibitors. Uh, every big farmer worked on it, and uh, every big farmer had the same results. So open research uh, would be much cheaper, avoids duplication, enhances success. Uh, but we can, we've, always had, we've already had a discussion how too much reduction of science doesn't work, and this slide was made several months ago, so I didn't know what we were going to hear. But the use of mice is not helpful if you want to treat human disease. Uh, hum using human tissue is really important. And of course, the reason why the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis was the pioneer in antibody therapy, in targeted uh, therapy of autoimmune diseases, is based on the fact that joints are quite accessible. People will give up bits and pieces of their joints, uh, either at surgery and biopsy quite willingly. They're less keen to give you a little bit of their pancreas or their brain because uh, there may be more risk. Uh, so using human tissue is really important. Uh, but another important thing is really to move slowly. How many people would do experiments like the uh, classical drug development that you are quite willing to invest 50 million before you know your answer by starting off therapeutic, asking first, is it non-toxic, then trying to work out the dose, and then only the third stage doing a definitive experiment. So this classical drug development phase one, two, three uh, is more than obsolete. It's quite counterproductive. It needs to be uh, uh, preceded by a way of knowing that your medicine does the right biochemistry and biology in humans. And that's because uh, you know, we are rather different from our small furry friends. Uh, and the most important difference isn't that we're less furry, we, don't, we have smaller tails, it's actually that we live a lot longer. So a mouse, the evolution of a mouse uh, Darwinian evolution is for about eight weeks after birth. By eight weeks in the natural environment, the mouse has already got pregnant and therefore no more Darwinian evolution. In humans, last time I looked, it was at least a hundred times longer. So, uh, so it's quite possible that early events may be the same in mice, but chronic events will be a bit different. Not all different, but there, there is an opportunity to have differences. Uh, and uh, the success rate would be improved in drugs if uh, one of the most common side effects, the risk of infection, uh, was looked after much more carefully by monitoring the immune response. And immunologists, 90% uh, work on mice. The immunology of mice is quite easy to study because any part of a mouse you want to study, of a mouse uh, will uh, volunteer. Uh, humans are rather different, so we can only access blood routinely, and so uh, uh, this is not a very good sample of the immune system. We have to work harder there, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. Uh, this is also, sounds too obvious not to be done, but actually the way the pharmaceutical industry wants to treat patients, wants to treat as many as possible, therefore it wants a broad definition. However, it makes much more sense uh, to try and find uh, those that are likely to respond. And really, genetic and biomarker analyses uh, need to be incorporated right from the beginning of uh, uh, the projects and the uh, therapeutic development. And really, in the end, 
what's quite important is to realize that uh, therapeutic developments do not stop once your drug is on sale. They continue, uh, and uh, I'll be discussing my pet project, how to get closer to a cure uh, by combining anti-TNF with others. And the way in which it's really important to track reality, because reality is different from the clinical registration trials. Clinical registration trials are done on patients, typically, which have only the disease you want to treat. However, by the time you get to my age, patients usually have a whole collection of, so of diseases, and that's what is the difference between a disease register uh, of patients under treatment compared to a clinical trial. But that's what matters, the real-life exposure, and not what happened in the trial. Uh, so to focus a little bit more about how to make things more effective and cheaper, well, I think the way that the pharmaceutical industry has done its preclinical studies, which is to, uh, to try and, uh, out and, and really guess what they should be targeting, uh, is not very useful. It's much better if uh, uh, the targets that the pharmaceutical industry would work on were targets that academia had actually established as being very likely to be responsible uh, in that uh, disease. And of course, if there was much more open preclinical work, uh, there wouldn't be the costs of duplication. The estimates for the P38 MAP kinase projects are about 20 billion was wasted on that. Uh, but, you know, won't discuss that in any more detail. Um, you know, it's much easier to improve assays if it's not done behind closed doors, if we can use the iterative processes integrated into science. And really, uh, for the proportion of human diseases where you might get human disease tissue, uh, that is really uh, the most important thing to do. And this is one of the drivers for uh, wanting preclinical research to be done in an open study because accessing well-documented human disease tissue is not easy for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, much, much easier in academia. And, uh, you know, in the same way, cancer cell lines as test beds for drugs uh, are not as good as fresh uh, tumour tissue, uh, and the animal models have already uh, had a whole lecture on how that's far too reductionist uh, to reflect real human disease. And I just want to point out that there are uh, uh, groups that are trying hard to uh, get pharmaceutical industry to work with them. For example, the Structural Genomics Consortium uh, came out of Toronto, led by Al Edwards, uh, uh, now has two bases, one in Toronto and one in Oxford. Uh, and they're really uh, working hard with industry, and I think successfully, to uh, uh, do much more of the preclinical work. Um, and uh, once a target is validated, then the different uh, companies can compete. Uh, for clinical trials, there are huge possibilities of uh, uh, reducing costs. Now, as an immunologist, uh, I've got my strong prejudices. Um, uh, and that's uh, that uh, biological products, uh, like antibodies, are actually much safer than small molecules. And one of the reasons why they're safer is that they're the products of evolution. Antibodies reflect more than 20 million years of evolution from jawed fish onwards to develop a system that will target almost every invader. And uh, therefore, it's not surprising that if it's evolved that way, that using this for re-engineering for our purposes might give us uh, some safe therapeutics with very good pharmacology and capacity. And of course, uh, this is what we're seeing now, uh, the uh, uh, discoveries of Kohler and Milstein, not patented by the MRC because they thought there was no commercial value to antibody ther therapy. Uh, this, this is now coming to bear. Um, 
I think the uh, toxicity of small molecules is uh, you know, inbuilt into the small molecules. Uh, they, they, they've got much smaller binding areas. So unless there are real pockets to bind to, it's quite challenging uh, to make them uh, specific. And hence, there's a greater risk of toxicity. And it's quite likely, although it's not yet known, that the cost of developing new antibodies is considerably less than the 1.2 um, or 3 billion uh, average for new therapeutics. But the biggest uh, cost in um, developing medicines is clinical trials. And of course, it's the clinical trial failures that add uh, dramatically. And really, um, if, um, if there's no evidence that the medicine works in humans, it's hard to understand uh, how the investment decision uh, to go this particular route uh, is actually made in industry. Uh, but of course, you know that it actually is. Uh, one of the issues that's uh, come up uh, as uh, so obvious that it would be in pharmacology, not in pharmacology 1.0, but pharmacology naught, is the importance of getting the right dose of a drug. And uh, the only anti-TNF uh, that never made it to market was developed uh, uh, by Roche and Genentech. And they decided in their wisdom that um, there was a certain maximal cost. Therefore, there was a certain maximal dose they would go to. And therefore, they never optimized the dose. And, uh, but that actually, that type of problem is not uh, unique, nor is targeting the wrong population the unique problem. Uh, and I think the difficulty for a lot of these problems uh, would be um, um, ameliorated with um, a wider range of uh, uh, interactions between industry and academia. Obviously, I'm prejudiced on that score. Um, so, what isn't known to most people is that uh, what we did developing anti-TNF therapy was actually an example of open drug development. Uh, we didn't know that that's what it was, but actually uh, that's what it was. So the history of this is this new hypothesis I uh, published uh, in 1983, a long time ago, a different era, not many hypotheses uh, published without any data these days. You'd be too worried of getting scooped. A and uh, at, the at the same time, uh, Tony Sarami in New York, a brilliant biochemist, uh, had convinced um, the industry that the septic shock was due to TNF. And therefore, about eight companies uh, decided to make monoclonal anti-TNFs or t t other TNF inhibiting uh, receptor fusion proteins uh, to treat sepsis. And the argument was simple. 300,000 people die of bacterial sepsis in America every year. Short-term treatment, they will get cured, will make a whole heap of money. Uh, it didn't come to pass, as you know, and uh, the reasons for it are uh, quite complicated and probably not worth discussing just yet. But we were, from our hypothesis that cytokines were important in autoimmunity, uh, we analyzed cytokine expression, uh, defined TNF as our target, uh, and uh, uh, were eventually able to test this uh, in humans with an antibody from one of these companies. I have to say it was quite challenging to get any of these companies uh, to help us, because uh, they thought what we were doing was very risky. The patients with arthritis may get infection if we block an important host defense molecule. And we, cut, we tried to explain to them they had been giving anti-TNF to patients that have enormous infection, but it didn't work. But it eventually worked when one of my PhD students joined the Center Corps. And I think all of you have students know exactly what data a student of yours will accept as important data, because that's what they learnt in your lab. Uh, so there's another lesson there. Be very nice to all your students, because you never know which one of them is going to make your career. Uh, uh, 
So we got a grant from Center Call, courtesy of my uh, ex-student, Jim Woody, and they gave us a drug, and we did the trial. Our first 10 patients did well. We told them 10 patients did well clinically, biochemically, you name it. Uh, and the response was to do, well, why don't you do another 10? Uh, so one of the things I do is that um, I also, like Larry, organize meetings and have been doing translational research meetings since 1984, although it never occurred to me to deliberately invite comedians to my meeting, although I've had some comedians that were, anyway, there. Uh, <laughs> And so when we had a meeting, it was actually that year in Israel in September. We did the trial from May to July, um, asked them, can we present the data in our translational meeting? And they said, yeah, why not? And, and that's really because they had no, uh, no appreciation uh, of what uh, might eventuate. They were busily uh, trying to treat arthritis by killing uh, T cells which actually didn't work. So we disclosed the results in September 92. So it turned out that this was a pilot scheme for uh, an open clinical development. Now, the importance of disclosing the results was that the other companies that already had anti-TNFs could then repurpose and reuse them in arthritis. And that's very much to the benefit of a patient community. And of course, all the rest uh, was pretty much uh, standard, although uh, uh, Immunex got there first uh, because um, uh, we couldn't convince Centacore that doing clinical trials on arthritis and Crohn's disease at the same time uh, was not uh, such a great idea. It's much better to, if you're a small company to focus on one topic. So, Let's look a little bit about how, what we did do. And I think this is a really important part of science, is new ideas. You know, I think science works by testing new ideas. And, uh, uh, you know, this was a, a very, uh, you know, su surprising at the time. Uh, the trigger to defining this new idea was the observation that in humans with uh, type 1 diabetes, thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, every autoimmune disease you could think of, the HLA molecules were upregulated. You could see them under the microscope. And uh, the, of course, the classical pathologists look at appearances, but they don't know the function of these molecules. So uh, Franco Batazzo, a worker in autoimmunity, came to see me showed me these pictures, said, what does it do? Well, I said, well, these molecules upregulate the immune system. This tells you the immune system is upregulated locally. Uh, and then, you know, seemed to me obvious, but looked around the literature. This was not in the literature. So I thought about more, and then we published this hypothesis, uh, which is really summarized in this cycle, that the T lymphocytes that recognize autoantigens are typically non-tolerant, so they can be activated by local autoantigens, and uh, then this would trigger um, activation of B cells, autoantibodies, activating macrophages, tissue damage. And so really an interesting question would be, what is it, might be the initial cause of upregulation of HLA? And the only thing that was known at the time was the work of Joe Oppenheim and Pat Steig that cytokines and interferons were capable of doing that, especially the interferons. And of course, that suggested that this might be all triggered by viruses. So we initially studied thyroid disease, but thyroid disease is very good for cell immunology. At operation, you get a large lump of meat, lots of cells. Uh, you can do a lot of immunology. But the disease has to be made quiescent. So short-lived molecular mediators we believe were very important in both initial triggering and the pathogenesis could not be studied. And that's why we moved to studying rheumatoid arthritis. And our basic tool and why we made big progress was the ease of accessing tissue. 
at the time, uh, surgery to remove sy inflamed synovium was quite common, so we had an abundance of tissue, uh, and so we could rapidly document what cytokines were present. Uh, and there was a lot of inflammatory cytokines present. And uh, to, to uh, our competitors in the field, uh, they abandoned the project because if there were many inflammatory cytokines, what was, which were doing essentially the same thing, what was the likelihood that blocking a single one would have a therapeutic effect? Now, during my PhD student days, uh, I had studied, uh, my initial PhD project at WeHi was developing immune responses of mouse spleen. And as we developed this project, it became very clear that supernatants of activated lymphoid cells had very powerful properties. Uh, and so we were always impressed by the function of cytokines, of these supernatants. And that's really be, go, was an important part of what we were, uh, uh, why we, we were very uh, sure that uh, cytokines uh, were probably were important. But with the presence of a large number of them and the capacity only to block one, the obvious experiment to do was to try and work out which one might be the most important. And because we had a good access to tissue and because my PhD project was learning how to optimize cultures, we were able to uh, develop a culture system where the diseased tissue was able to replicate the, mo the inflammatory molecules it was meant we could document were being made. And uh, this is the, uh, my colleague, Ravinda Maney, that I've worked with uh, uh, more than 25 years. Uh, Fanula Brennan was the postdoc that did the pivotal experiment which was to add antibodies to TNF, which we got from Genentech. No material transfer agreement, no restrictions, do what you like. Quite different to the situation now, where it would take you six months to do the material transfer agreement, and the agreement would probably include that you'd give them your house, your wife, children, <laughs> the lot, uh, if you... Uh, anyway. This was a very surprising result. This was not what we expected because we were, this was a bioassay um, for interleukin-1. If you study animals, it turns out the most destructive cytokine you can put into rabbit joint was interleukin-1. Therefore, this was the belief that rheumatoid arthritis was due to interleukin-1. But this experiment that Fanula did uh, which we, she had to repeat many times to make sure uh, it was reproducible, suggested that uh, TNF was more important because it regulated interleukin-1. And of course, this particular uh, TNF driving other pro-inflammatory cytokines experiment was repeated uh, with other pro-inflammatory cytokines, and the TNF blockade did block, at least in the culture system, the other pro-inflammatory cytokines in rheumatoid synovium, uh, but not in osteoarthritis. So this was the first clue that this might be a therapeutic target. Uh, so what I want to show you here, uh, let's, this, okay, good, well done, is um, fast forward for another uh, four years. Uh, we had to study mice because every pharmaceutical company asked us what happens in the mice, so we eventually had to do it. So with the, the grant from Centacor, they gave us the antibody. The antibody had been used in sepsis. 10 milligrams per kilogram was safe. And since they gave us money to treat 10 patients, we did a very um, good dose response curve. We decided to use the maximum tolerable dose the maximum dose they'd used before, because as immunologists, we thought antibodies are safe. Uh, and this is a patient at uh, 23 years of age that's already had rheumatoid arthritis for five years and has had every available treatment uh, possible uh, to that time. She got a very large amount of uh, anti-TNF. This is the antibody at the time called CA2, 
now it's in Flixi Mab or Remicade that's uh, contributed. Uh, uh, it came out of the laboratory of uh, Jan Vilcek at NYU, so most of the profits academically have gone to NYU. Uh, So, you know, you, you would say this is a typical patient, but everybody knows you don't show your average data, you show the best data. So this was a good one. Uh, and so uh, that was done in 92. The registration, the first approval of anti-TNF was etanercept by Immunex, not an antibody, but an antibody receptor fusion protein. Uh, and now there are five uh, anti-TNFs on the market uh, with uh, combined sales uh, of 27 billion last year. Now, the way the sort of the payers uh, are not very helpful to the patients in the number of diseases. And in this disease, the problem is that the payers on all continents want you to fail the cheap medicines first. Unfortunately, uh, in the inflammatory diseases, just like in cancer, the earlier you treat, the better you do. So this is standard of care in yellow, where you typically will not get your anti-TNF till you're about three or four years into the disease. So about 70%, sorry, here, about 70 to 80% the green uh, is this late rheumatoid, uh, three or more years in, uh, and about 70 to 80% respond if you're using a 20% improvement rate. Now, 20% improvement rate is not really what the patients want. Uh, and uh, nobody's cured. However, if you start uh, much, er if you start um, with, um, you know, much earlier patients, then what you get is about 10% of the patients are effectively cured. So you get a much a higher degree uh, of response and a much bigger proportion of response. So it's very difficult to know, you know how to integrate this data, how many patients are early, but I think it's pretty obvious that um, we're not doing very well uh, at what really matters to patients, uh, being cured on drugs or off drugs, and probably half of these, if they started within the first three months, can be taken off all medicine. So that's really... Uh, what the patients want. We know it's achievable because it, is, it has been achieved uh, in several thousand patients, but it's not achieved in the majority. And I think it's been uh, quite uh, uh, s sad that the industry has not wanted to change the paradigms. For the last 15 years, um, anti-TNF therapy has been running, uh, delivering uh, probably... 30, 35% of the way towards a cure if you weight the average of a patient. Now, is 30 or 35% good or bad? Well, it is what it is. It's a lot better than for most diseases, but I think we could do better. The improvements are shown here. There's no more wheelchairs, walking frames, joint surgery for rheumatoids are all gone. So there is certainly um, a significant improvement in the quality of life and the patients are certainly uh, happy. But I think we do know we, from this sort of data that we could do a lot better. So well, how might we do better? Well, I think it's important to realise that uh, in certain diseases, we do get closer to a cure. So getting more than 35% of the way uh, is possible. And the usual approach is combination therapy. Now, this has risks. The more medicines you have, the more toxicities you have. And in immune diseases, it's certainly infection. Uh, and this has been, uh, there have been two trials of combination therapy. They weren't the trials we would have recommended. Uh, for example, blocking TNF and blocking R1 is like blocking, you know, siblings. They're far too close to each other. Uh, and blocking TNF and, seed and blocking antigen presentation is certainly going to be an infectious risk. 
But I think there is prospects of doing it better uh, and uh, in, with two improvements. One is to design combinations where one is targeting uh, anti-chronicity mechanisms that are not involved in host offence, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. So this is what um, we are trying to do. Now, the, we failed to do this with the existing companies in the anti-TNA field, but one of the um, wonderful things, the byproducts of 27 billion on sales, is that there are 21 generics for antibodies, they're called biosimilars, coming down the pike. So the, as an optimist, I think I might be able to find one that wants to work with us. So. But we would believe, because this is state of the art, to use this combination, uh, this is a combination that uh, my institute has patents, so we have a nice shiny new building uh, in Oxford, and thanks to that. Uh, this is the biggest unmet need. Because the patients that don't do well on this therapy need something else. But it, it's quite easy to document that even those that are not doing well are getting some benefit, and therefore they don't really want to uh, stop it. And if you look at what's happened in the 15 years uh, since we knew anti-TNF worked, basically industry has tried 20 other therapeutics, four of which has made it to the marketplace, None of them work better. The ones that are in marketplace are roughly equivalent, uh, but they're used much less often because their sales are only about one to two billion each. So there's a much smaller uh, unmet need than what to do with these guys. Now, I've totally told you that combinations had tried, had failed, but I think we know that the reason they failed is that they were entirely focused on... Uh, the inflammatory immune aspects. And so targeting chronicity mechanisms not involved in host defense uh, should be more interesting. And actually, there are such mechanisms. Uh, it's very clear that uh, cells in the body uh, work, interact, so the immune system is dependent for its survival on stromal cells. So the fibroblasts like synoviocytes in the joint are an important part of the tissue process. Same is true in cancer. Same is true in atherosclerosis, of an atherosclerosis that's smooth muscle cells rather than fibroblasts. An increased tissue mass, like rheumatoid arthritis tissue, um, uh, needs blood vessels to sustain itself. And so these uh, are areas that could be targeted. Uh, lots of hurdles. Uh, this is the only example I can show you that actually works as combination. This is by blocking angiogenesis. Uh, in a mouse, it works fine by itself, uh, but if you reduce the dose, you'd get a, quite a good synergy with anti-TNF. So this is suboptimal dose of anti-TNF, suboptimal dose of uh, uh, VEGF blockade. You get a, a nice uh, combination compared to the two alone. So I think this principle is possible, but it wouldn't be our favourite. The favourite would be to block the fibroblast-like synovocytes. This gentleman in Stanford has pioneered human immune monitoring, and I think that's essential to make sure that we uh, can uh, do this safely, and we expect uh, somologic technology. Apologies for the advertisement, but it is what we are planning to do. Uh, will be useful in this uh, scheme. And so to conclude, we do have to reduce healthcare costs. Inefficiency is the major driver of a cost of therapeutics. So if we can improve efficiency, uh, we might do rather better. Uh, unfortunately, I'm only talking to you about reducing the cost of a very small component of the total healthcare bill. It's not too reducing the cost of the 2.9 trillion, but it is trying to make a dent into the 400 billion spent on drugs. Every bit would be a help. And I think we could do much better if we cared, just like in global warming. Um, so I think I've, we've, I've run out of time, um, and these are some of my important uh, collaborators. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Okay. You got it. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you, you, you mentioned hep hepatitis C. I was just curious. I had it many years ago. I'm over the virus, but I have some uh, internal bleeding issues, you know, from the portal hypertension, the cirrhosis, fibrosis. Now, this oh, one... I can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, what do you think as far as maybe the, the, your treatment uh, protocol for sepsis or infection or, or, and or peritonitis? Might, might, might that correlate to people? Most people are getting over their hepatitis C infection now, but they're, they're left with the residual damage of having had the virus. I was just wondering if you have a correlation for that. Thank you. Um, I would have to pass on that. That's not my field of expertise. Anybody else? Oh. Mark, uh, thank you for the in, entire story from hypothesis to uh, drug to commercialization. It was striking how important it was that there were anti-TNF drugs already being developed for other purposes yeah. as you developed your hypothesis. Yeah. Can you take us through a scenario of what might have occurred had they not already been in development or not available to you? Um, well, you know, making antibodies um, to define molecules is not that challenging, wasn't even that challenging then. Uh, so I think it would have added uh, uh, a gap of another two years while they would have been made. Um, I, I think it's um, conceivable that we would have been able to get traction to get them made. But I think it's, um, it's an important uh, point because there are uh, a huge number of uh, projects uh, in academia, in biotech, that get to the stage where they need this therapeutic and they can't get this 10 to 20 million needed to make the therapeutic. So we were lucky. But as you know, uh, history is always written by the winners, so you get the story of the people that had the good luck. Yeah. What's the relative cost uh, of these drugs in Great Britain versus here? Uh, about 50% less. But it's very important to note that the profit margin on the antibodies is well over 90% these days, just like small molecules. So I think there is an opportunity for when the biosimilars come, the price will drop because the companies that are making the biosimilars are companies that have huge resources, Pfizer, Merck. So I think there's, there's an opportunity to reduce the cost. Thank you. Thank you.